at kpfa.org. And the time is 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of Terra Verde, a weekly environment program on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm your host for today, Zoe loftus Farin. Tomorrow, June 23rd, marks the 30-year anniversary of the day when James Hansen, at the time head of NASA's Institute for Space Studies, testified before a Senate committee about the greenhouse effect and how it was warming our climate. His testimony made headlines around the country and propelled climate change into the mainstream of our public discourse. 30 years later, our understanding of climate change and its many impacts has come a long way. But our success in stemming greenhouse gas emissions, <clears throat> and as a result, limiting their many climate impacts, has been much more limited. With the climate-denying administration in the White House and the clock ticking on our ability to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, scientists, activists, planners, and folks from all different disciplines have been working double time to build public understanding of how climate change is affecting us and will continue to affect us. Groups from many disciplines are also working to develop local and state policies to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and to begin planning for the inevitable warming that we've already committed ourselves to. We have two guests with us today to discuss local impacts and what we can expect from climate change here in the Bay Area, as well as some of the innovative work being done to prepare for sea level rise right here. Christy Dahl is a senior scientist with the Union for Concerned Scientists, an organization that uses science to solve our planet's biggest problems. And Allison Brooks is chair of the Resilient by Design Executive Board. Resilient by Design is a Bay Area design challenge working to develop innovative, community-based solutions that build resilience to sea level rise, severe storms, and flooding, among other things. She's also executive director of the Bay Area Regional Collaborative, which helps coordinate the four regional agencies in the Bay Area. Christy, Allison, welcome to Terra Verde. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christy, just this week, the Union of Concerned Scientists released a new analysis estimating how many houses across the country will be threatened by chronic high tide flooding in the years to come as a result of sea level rise. As the report pointed out, this includes many homes in California, as well as right here in the Bay Area. Can you tell us about the analysis and what you and your colleagues found? Absolutely. So we've known for a long time that sea levels are rising and that puts our coastal communities at risk. But this near-term threat to coastal property, our homes and our businesses, has really been flying under the radar and largely isn't accounted for in current coastal real estate markets. So we knew the data existed to try to understand this better. And so we wanted to analyze that data to make this threat real to people not just here in the Bay Area or in California, but across the nation. What did what you find? <laughs> we found that nationwide, in just the next 30 years, there are over 300,000 homes at risk of chronic flooding or flooding that happens on average every other week. That includes about 13,000 homes here in the Bay Area. Wow. And um, for the rest of California? In the 2045 time frame, for California as a total, we see about 20,000 homes at risk. So really, the Bay Area has the majority of them. Wow. And as you mentioned, the research focuses on chronic flooding, which is um, defined as flooding occurring 26 more or more times a year, which is really a lot. Um, are places that flood with that frequency livable, in your opinion? Well, different communities and different homeowners are going to have different levels of tolerance in terms of their flood risk. There are some communities that see that frequency of flooding today, but if it's not impacting a lot of infrastructure or homes, then it's something that they do live with. 
On the other hand, we see communities like Miami Beach in Florida that started to take action and invest hundreds of millions of dollars in flood mitigation um, when they were seeing many fewer floods than that per year. Got it. Um, and, you know, I'm you by focusing on, on chronic flooding in particular, um, we're also not quite capturing in that all the other effects of climate change, like uh, less chronic flooding that still occurs or um, hurricanes, extreme storms. Can we kind of assume that the impact on our coastal property is actually much bigger? Absolutely. So this sea level rise induced flooding is really just one of the risks that we face. As you mentioned, there are many, many other impacts of climate change. And certainly coastal residents, particularly on the East Coast, have been living with a certain amount of risk, knowing that they could be hit by a hurricane or a strong nor'easter with storm surge. But we're really seeing the level of risk amplified. Allison, I'd, I'd like to jump over to you. I know one of the things that Resilient by Design was aiming to address in particular was was flooding in addition to other factors um, associated with with climate change and other natural disasters like earthquakes. Um, Can you tell us more about the challenge and really what it was about? Sure. And thanks again for having uh, me. I'm so excited to talk about this project. Uh, we rely, you know, we all rely on the, the types of science and data that organizations like Union of Concerned Scientists produce. There's lots of other agencies and organizations in the Bay Area that have been doing a tremendous ad- amount of work to help us as a region get our arms around our vulnerabilities and the risks we face with storm surge and flooding and sea level rise. Um, organizations that I work with, like the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, the San Francisco Francisco Estuary Institute, and actually a lot of our local governments at the county level, Marin County, San Mateo County, Alameda County, um, and now Contra Costa are, are, are doing a lot of work to really understand uh, the risks that we face. That can be rather overwhelming and almost immobilizing if you're a reg- you know a, just a regular citizen or someone trying to figure out uh you know can we do anything about this and and uh what can we do so that you know being close to the place where I think we really have a strong grasp of where we're most vulnerable, even the types of things we can be doing, the interventions and the, you know, understanding where we're most vulnerable and the right things to do in the right places, we felt it essential to open up people's imaginations and bring some of the leading thinkers in this area around sea level rise and flooding and, and also seismic risks, risks, which we face here in the Bay Area, um, to help us think in new ways about our future and the types of things we can be doing now, not only to address these longer-term challenges, but as Christy noted, they're not so long-term. Some of our communities now and some of our most historically marginalized, uh, underserved communities are often at the front lines of the risk, um, but really help us think about how we can make these investments to be more resilient and create other benefits at the same time. So uh, it's an audacious goal. And on top of it, knowing, uh, you know, this was modeled after something called Rebuild by Design that was after Superstorm Sandy in 2013 on the East Coast. And as we know, that was a response to a really tragic uh, disaster that caused a lot of harm for a lot of people and a lot of infrastructure. Uh, they put forward this idea to have these design teams come in and pitch some ideas to make the shoreline mo- more resilient. And the Hous- U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development offered a billion dollars at the end of that for those designs that really gained traction to help move them forward. Well, of course, we don't have a billion dollars at the end of this, but we do have a track record in the Bay Area of uh of raising funds, putting our, our money where our mouth is to be more resilient and address issues um, related to climate and other issues like transportation. Um, and the Rockefeller Foundation took note of that when we passed Measure AA in 2016, which was a parcel tax, the first region-wide parcel tax. People voted it in overwhelming numbers and, you know, in a place that we have to approve these by two-thirds vote. Um, Rockefeller took notice that we invested in marsh marshlands, wetlands, natural solutions to protect our urbanized areas and a deal with sea level rise and flooding. And we now have, um, over the next 20 years, we're, we have about half a billion dollars to put towards that. So 
they the Rockefeller Foundation was a real uh, was a major investment in this resilient by design Bay Area challenge, which we this first phase, and we really call this the first phase of a much longer set of of uh, things we need to be doing in the Bay Area. But I do think it was effective in opening people's minds, working, and of course these teams worked alongside with community members, tapping into the local experts. Really, you know, so it's this: how do you bring this international national expertise and combine it with local knowledge about place to start to move towards solutions. And so to, to be um, clear, it was a design challenge that kind of nine designs kind of came through yeah. to the end um, phase. And can you speak a little bit more about that part of it? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, we had ultimately we had nine. We had 51 teams uh, apply to be part of this process. And we selected ultimately ended up being nine teams that were matched through a uh, really in-depth process to ma- match with places where we saw um, some, we know that there's great vulnerabilities in a range of places around the Bay. Uh, we really cover, we wanted to touch every county. We wanted to touch different types of conditions. So we have more urbanized areas. We have um, more uh, nat- places where it's more around the natural systems. And we really got a good mix. The idea there was, you know, we, not every, we couldn't cover every part of the shoreline or, or every community, but how could we learn from these places and apply this to other communities in the Bay Area, not just the Bay Area, but throughout California, nationally, internationally? Right. And um, did you see the challenge as, as effective kind of at raising awareness, both among, you know, the, the people directly involved and the broader Bay Area community? I, I, I do. And, you know, some of the... Some of these ideas that, that came forward might gain more traction than others. Uh, like I said, uh, I think it was a way to really start to think about the types of interventions. You know, we, some of, um, you know, a lot of our shoreline has been very, there's been a lot of interventions on our shoreline. We have a lot of concrete and a lot of, um, you know, flood control channels and uh, hardscapes. And this whole notion and some of the teams, a lot of the teams really put forward this idea of the bay and how we use wetlands and marshes as the sponge. This notion of how we, we know that there's more water coming. How do we absorb it? And in the meantime, how do we make some of these places that we've over-engineered in some cases – uh, or parks or even just opening up some of these hardscapes and make our communities more livable in the meantime and actually help them absorb some of the additional water that's coming into our communities. Right. And um, Christy, I, I wanted to, to turn back to you a little bit. Um, I just read a Bloomberg analysis this week looking at coastal property values and typically when we think of coastal properties, you know, they're they're coveted. People will pay a lot for a beachside home. But the Bloomberg analysis found that over the past decade, the average home price in areas facing the lowest risks of flooding and other climate-related risks like hurricane had far outpaced prices in um, places with the greatest risk. And homes in areas exposed to greater flood and hurricane risks were also worth less last year on average than they were a decade earlier. The theory is that people are starting to consider these risks more and factoring them into decisions about where they live. So I'd love to hear kind of how those findings align with your um, recent analysis and if you think we're going to be seeing more kind of of trends in that direction at all. Yeah, that was a really exciting analysis uh, to see come out. And it dovetailed really nicely with the risks that we've identified in our report. Um. We do know that in some places that that risk of flooding is starting to uh, percolate into the market. Like you said, um, there was recently a study of the Miami area, for example, that showed just that, that the most flood risk, flood prone places are not gaining in property value as much as places that are on higher ground. Um, we've also heard a lot of anecdotal evidence of that over the years. So to start to see these um, more rigorous analyses come out um, really does start to give us an indication of where people's minds are going. We do know, however, that there are places where when rebuilding happens after a natural disaster like a hurricane, places are being built to be more high end than they were before the storm hit. And so we need to be extremely conscious as we're um, 
as we're rebuilding it, as we're responding to disasters, as we're preparing, hopefully, for disasters before they hit, that we aren't pricing people out. And this is Zoe loftus Farin. You're tuned in to Terra Verde. Today, we're discussing sea level rise issues here in the Bay Area, as well as around the country, and um, impacts on our homes and property, and how planners are envisioning a more resilient future for us. Here with us are Christy Dahl, Senior Scientist with the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Allison Brooks, Chair of the Resilient by Design Executive Board. And um, I want to uh, shift a little bit to talk about some specific adaptation measures. You you kind of touched on this um, a bit already, Allison. But you know, when I was looking through the Resilient by Design website um, and the projects that were chosen to kind of be taken forward into the design phase of the challenge, it seemed pretty clear that there was an emphasis on the use of nature and natural systems, as you as you mentioned, mm-hmm. um, wetlands. Kind of like the sponge idea. I'd wonder if you could talk about a few more of those and how um, how designers are really working with the natural system to increase our resilience. Right, and this is really where science and, and design mar- are married, uh, because you know one of the things, we're, and there's some really important work underway uh, in in our region by uh, Professor Mark Stacy out of UC Berkeley, that's really under you know laying out this. Um, the, the data and the science around the bay really functions as a bathtub. And what you do on one part of the shoreline can have great impact on a, another part of the shoreline. So if you are a jurisdiction and just want to protect your residents, as, as is your responsibility to do, and decide to put a seawall up, that may have negative impacts on surrounding uh, communities. That's not to say that in the Bay, as we think about how we're going to tackle this issue at a regional scale, which ultimately needs to be, um, you know, built and deployed at a local scale, we need, we are in this process of identifying where we have to have a mix of these natural solutions and more of the hardscape solutions and, um, and understanding the dynamics. So the team's Identify those places where natural solutions are, are already in place and can be enhanced and other ways in which we can create more, more of these natural solutions to address some of the problems that, that we've been talking about. Um, one really good example was, uh, through a team called Public Sediment, uh, at Alameda Creek, which is down by Union City, Fremont area. Um, and their project is really around restoring Alameda Creek. And the whole notion there, it, taking what was a very engineered uh, solution that has had impacts on, you know, the ability of fish and sediment to move through this this system. And we rely on sediment to be that source, that critical source of um, it's essentially mud. We're going to rely on mud to help us address this issue over time. So their their approach was how do you invite people back to this what should be an asset for the community and help you know, create that access where people can interact with nature and become greater environmentalists in the process and understand how these natural systems work to contribute to our quality of life and and our long-term resiliency in the Bay and um, improve how that water flow is flowing to the Bay and bringing sediment to the Bay. And in the meantime, uh, creating this other goal of protecting us from extreme flooding or an additional uh, water that's coming at us from all directions. So that's one one example. And just to mention uh, another one or two that caught my eye, uh-huh. um, I saw there was, you know, there was a lot of like more green space um, in the proposals. There was um, a proposal for air quality parks, they were called, uh-huh. where, you know, trees in uh planting dense trees in parking lots, empty parking lots. And then there was also um, an estuary commons that included floating houses, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're yeah. pretty creative. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, to bring up the estuary commons one, that that is a team um, that worked, uh, the All Bay Collective, that worked with uh, community or- groups in Deep East Oakland. And um, really, so this is where, Christy, I'm glad you raised that point around, um, you know, the cost of pr- housing and how some of these disasters 
disasters can in, can have the uh, unintended of, uh, impact of uh, driving people out. And we know that we're already experiencing that issue in the Bay Area. We we have historically marginalized communities and, and, and low-income people and people of color that are being displaced uh, because of income inequality and the spiraling housing costs. So this, you can't go in and start to solve for these longer-term challenges and talk about wetlands and, and marshes without uh, recognizing that people have very near-term challenges that we're facing. So the All Bay Collective worked with these organizations, and it was really about both uh, empowering local community members to be the ones that are putting these ideas forward. They know their community the best. They have that lived experience. And working, so you're combining local e- expertise with some of the people that are thinking about uh, ecology and engineers that are thinking about this stuff and applying it in a lot of different conditions. And they work together on things like floating housing. And it may seem outrage- outlandish, but this is happening in other parts of the world. And it's worth exploring. And it's worth thinking about, even if, say, our finance system doesn't necessarily support floating housing. <laughs> it might be something we need to think about now and into the future. Definitely, and that actually um, is the perfect lead to what I want to jump into next, which is kind of the practical side of some of this. Um, resilience planning, particularly here in the Bay Area, um, but really anywhere. Uh, Christy, in the analysis that you and your colleagues released, you mentioned this tricky cycle with respect to financing through which communities looking for funding for resilience planning might really have to show that they've already been adapting and and building resilience in order to show that they're a good investment for more funds and that that could be really um, especially difficult for communities with fewer resources. So could you kind of talk a little bit more about that and how it might be overcome? Sure. So as we start exploring our options for uh, reducing our risk to flooding, a lot of those options are costly, um, whether they are hard measures like seawalls or um, really outlandish measures like floating <laughs> houses. Um, communities are going to need resources. Often we raise money for those sorts of large infrastructure projects through the bond market. But if a community is already experiencing a lot of flooding, then it may be difficult to raise that money because it's not seen it's seen as a risky investment and yet if you so if you don't raise that money and raise those resources early on you could fall behind in your ability to do so but i just wanted to comment a little bit on the resilient um, by design things because so often when we think about the risks of sea level rise to our properties a weight sets in within us because we're talking about our homes and our neighborhoods and it's seen as maybe not a near-term crisis but certainly a crisis and it's hard to see what our options are and I think what's really amazing about Resilient by Design is that it gives us a new vision of what our coasts could look like. It's not just a vision of flooded homes but really this is a way to re-envision our coasts and look at some new opportunities that um, can open up the ways we're living along the coast yeah i think that's a great point um i did also you know want to talk about the coordination issues with some of these um ambitious kind of planning and, and design responses so you know, financing isn't the only challenge. Um, looking at a lot of the resilient by design challenge uh, projects, just as an example, they um, really cross city and county borders, as do the impacts of climate change and sea level rise. And implementation will really require a lot of collaboration and cooperation. Um, so in addition to your work with Resilient by Design, Allison, you're also executive director of Bay Area Regional Collaborative, which, as um, I mentioned earlier, coordinates um, four different Bay Area agencies. Um, so I'd love to kind of get your take on the collaboration side of this and how cities and counties can and already are working together on these issues. Yeah, uh, you know, collaboration is in my job title, and that's not in everybody's job title. And uh, but it is going to require, and I think that's what Resilient by Design was really uh, focused on demonstrating and illustrating: is we 
you know, these are 21st century challenges and we're still using in some, you know, 20th century, in some cases, 19th century governance structures, financing structures, all kinds of structures that no longer apply to this future we have before us. So, you know, we absolutely have to be working across disciplines, across sectors, across jurisdictions. And in some cases, you know, especially to tap in to the financing system, because some of the, as I, as I mentioned, some of these projects, uh, many, all of them have multiple dimensions to them. They're going to have a housing component. They're going to have a stormwater management component, a transportation component. And there's different sources of money that flows to each one of those that requires a level of coordination and, and frankly, entrepreneurship and creativity and how we're putting the, the finance plan together for these and how we're orienting our decision-making process and how we're bringing people to the table to work and problem solve together. Um, and, you know, I'm saying this in a time where the trust with, of the public sector and trust in general among all kinds of people is really broken down. And, um, you know, that's something we have to address. We have to build that trust again. We have to learn how to work together and compromise and, uh, you know, figure out how to solve for these huge problems. And um, I feel like Resilient by Design, we had some really hard conversations and some challenging conversations and that's necessary and we need to create that space and that ongoing space to learn how to work together again and do you see that happening i do i do and it's hard um but like i said people have to feel comfortable kind of stepping into an uncomfortable space and i do see it happening i think there's a, a, you know this based on the receptivity to having a place to come together and talk about this stuff through resilient by design and having you know events and ways for people to engage and learn and talk to each other i there is such we had thousands of people wanting to participate in this and those were the people that have were able to hear about it we did as much as we could to get the word out but um i think it's really important to continue these types of processes and we're so thankful to the Rockefeller Foundation and the other foundations that funded this. And we have, you know, it, I think this can apply in other conditions. We need to figure out how to do it um, with the resources that we have. Right. It definitely seemed that a lot of the kind of designs that people came up with were adaptable to other places. Um, I did just want to touch on one other thing. Um, you know, we've been talking about resilience planning and basically with the idea of avoiding having to move out of the Bay Area, places that we live. But, you know, I'm wondering if there are some places where maybe we have to stop building or rebuilding in some cases. And, and Christy, I wonder if you could kind of talk about that and whether we may have to start relocating people, kind of rethinking our tendency to rebuild after disasters. Absolutely. So we see places... Um, that are just that are flooding over and over again and the residents there are facing really the difficult choices about whether to stay and live with that risk or whether to leave and sometimes that means leaving you the family home that you've lived in your family's been in for generations or you know moving away from the neighborhood where you saw your children grow up i mean these are heart-wrenching decisions people are making um and yet they're conversations that we have to have and uh, it can either happen in a haphazard sort of way after disasters um, and that's typically how retreat has been handled in our country or we can start envisioning some frameworks for it that communities can can build on and discuss that states can support that hopefully eventually our federal government can get on board with so that we're not leaving communities, um, for lack of a better term, high and dry. <laughs> right. So doing some of the kind of same planning that the Resilient by Design uh, project has done for resilience building in terms of possible other adaptation measures. Yeah. And again, it, it will potentially come back to having some really difficult conversations in your community. So that's all the time that we have for today's show. To learn more, you can check out the Resilient by Design uh, website as well as Union of Concerned Scientists. And I really want to thank both Allison and Christy for joining us today. Thank you also to sound engineer Erica Bridgman. This show and others are available online at kpfa.org for your listening convenience. And have a great weekend, everyone. 
Are you wanting support to resolve conflicts in your life? Do you wish you were better at creating a peaceful and just world? On Talk It Out Radio, Sundays from 7 to 8 p.m., we offer the skills of self-compassion, effective communication, and creating understanding across differences. Come listen, call in, and practice with us. Talk It Out. Talk It Out. Talk It Out Radio, Sundays, 7 to 8 p.m. on KPFA. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24H 